the underlying theme here is that the diseases that afflict Americans, heart attacks, strokes, dementia, diabetes, and cancer are entirely avoidable. It doesn't have to happen to you. And you could have a great, healthy, and healthier, and much happy life, and really enjoy your golden years, which Americans' golden years are, should be called coal years or something, because they're suffering, they're in pain, they're medically dependent, they're getting procedures performed on them, they're living in nursing homes, they're definitely not enjoying their life, being, being tortured. What good is it to live a long time? And what good, even good is it to have money if your life, if you're in torture and in pain and can't enjoy your life? The most, when you take great care of your health when you're young, the reward that you get is you really get an enjoyable life for your whole life. And it's not just that you're going to live 20 years longer. It's that the, those 20 years between the ages of 80 and 100 years old, you're going to fully enjoy those years. What good is it to live longer if you have not fully living, right? All right, so let's get started. So the first part of review is that food gives us nutrients, and nutrients determine your long-term health. So how do nutrients determine your long-term health? Like we have macronutrients, which are big nutrients. The word macro means big. And the macronutrients are fat, carbohydrate, and protein. But water is also a macronutrient. But here we're considering the three calorie-containing macronutrients, fat, carbohydrate, and protein. And the first thing you have to know and solidly put into action is that the more macronutrients you consume in your life, the shorter your lifespan. They always say you can measure your lifespan by measuring your waistline to a degree. You know, right? The longer your waistline, the shorter your life lifespan. But in any case, excess calories shorten lifespan dramatically more than anything else. Even if you're not overweight. If you're not overweight, you can still can eat excess calories, it's still shortening your lifespan. And the other, and food also gives us micronutrients. And micronutrients are, of course, non-caloric portion of food, vitamins, minerals, phytochemicals, and antioxidants. And there are numerous scores of them, but there are literally hundreds, maybe even thousands of nutrients that haven't even been discovered yet. And those non-discovered nutrients are also essential for human health. I'll say that one more time. That even the nutrients that don't have names, the thousands of nutrients, each strawberry has 700 nutrients. Each broccoli has 500 nutrients in it. The ones we haven't named yet and haven't discovered yet are still important for human immune function and human longevity. Did you follow that? So what I'm saying here is that your lifespan has to do with consuming adequate micronutrients without consuming excessive amount of calories or macronutrients. As a matter of fact, the only thing ever been proven in the history of science to radically extend lifespan is moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient excellence. I say that over and over again because I want you to be able to articulate and say that, and, 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 and say that, say that back at me and say it to other people. The only thing proven in the history of science to radically extend lifespan of all species of animal, including primates like us, is moderate caloric restriction in an environment of micronutrient excellence. It's the only thing that's ever been proven. The rest of the stuff is just hypothesis. What makes my work unique is that I've demonstrated in scientific studies and in 30 years of medical practice that when people improve the micronutrient content and completeness of their diet, it makes it easier for them to eat less calories. In other words, the way we put people back in touch with, the right, with desiring the right amount of calories is giving them a diet with an ideal level of micronutrients and fiber in it. If your diet, and the opposite is also true, if your diet is micronutrient deficient, it almost becomes impossible not to overeat calories. Did you follow that? That's an important theme of this presentation. Why, you're all, why this, all the people I'm looking at are overweight? Because your diet is micronutrient deficient. You're not eating enough greens, and not eating enough salad, and sprouts, and tomatoes, and onions, and mushrooms. You're not eating enough and wild berries. You're not eating those foods sufficiently. If you were, you couldn't be that, that overweight, because those foods suppress your appetite. So. This is basic nutritional information, and this is the first principle of a nutritarian diet. The very first principle is H equals N over C. 
It means your healthy life expectancy, how long you're going to live, and the quality of your life in your later years is proportional to your nutrient per calorie density of your diet all through life. That means you have to seek out foods that have a higher nutrient bang per caloric buck and eat them. And that also means you have to avoid foods that do not contain nutrients and just give you concentrated calories. And the more you eat foods that have calories in them without nutrients, the more you shorten your life. Every bite you take of foods that don't have nutrients in them, you shorten your life. Reminds me of a song. Every bite you take, every step you take. Yeah. <laughs> so that bagel, that pizza, that croissant, that ice cream, whatever it is you're eating out there in the front, whatever. I was very disturbed by watching a whole horde of people after listening to my lecture yesterday walk to the front of the room and start to eat white flour pizza with Frankenstein cheese on top. That, that commercial vegan cheese is probably more dangerous than regular cheese. Processed junk food. I'm saying, was it ready to um, strangle these people? You crazy? It shows that they're so addicted to food. Even listening to all day about why not to eat it, the minute it's shoved right in front of it, they went right to it like rats. Never seen anything like it in my life. It's a good scientific study. How worthless is it is lecturing to people? <laughs> What's that? Okay. Your last meal, right? All right, so who wants to take, who wants to volunteer? Raise their hand and volunteer. Great, and tell me the, what's the first principle of a nutritarian diet in your own words? You can repeat my words, you can make your own words up. What is it? Yes, that, thank you. Right, you want to strive for that. And that means that the more you eat foods that have low nutrients in them, the more you're, you know, even excess calories shorten lifespan. And even if I had, 25 calories a day too much. One bite of a cookie or one bite of a bagel or one little nibble of that pizza. It was 25 calories a day too much. Over 365 days, that's 30 pounds in three years. I mean, excuse me, that's 30 pounds in 10 years. 30 pounds on my body, that's 180 pounds. That took 20, 15 years off my life, right? Why would I want to do that? Throw away 15 years of one bite of food. What if I took in 50 calories a day too little? Then what would happen? become anorexic? In other words, we can determine with a calorimeter, with some equipment and by, with measuring what calories my body requires to maintain my muscle and skeletal mass. How many calories do I need to maintain my perfect weight where I am right now? We determine that accurately, and what if I undershoot it by 50 calories or 100 calories a day? Then what happens to me? I lose weight. I don't lose weight. Stay the same. Because when you, when you mildly undershoot calories, your body will maintain, because I put demands on my body. I exercise, I went to the gym this morning, I do, I do sports, and I have demands on my body that wants to maintain this amount of muscle tissue to do the things I like to do. So my body will maintain that. It'll adjust its metabolic rate, and it'll adjust the rate at which it utilizes calories to maintain the muscle and bone. What it'll do if I take in less calories, so my weight doesn't go up and down. Actually, I've weighed about 150 pounds since I'm 18 years old, and I haven't gained or lost a pound in, in, um, in um, 50 years, right? 50, 60, about that, yeah. About 50 years, I haven't gained or lost weight in 50 years. How can I gain weight? I don't eat always the same amount of calories each day. I mean, sometimes I eat more, sometimes I eat less. Sometimes I don't eat much for a couple of days, or I don't even lose any weight. How come? Your body adjusts. How does your body adjust to a lower caloric load? Is it lowers its respiratory quotient because you lose a lot of calories by breathing. Your calories can adjust, it can lose or gain calories by the way it breathes, so you'll blow off less calories with respiration. And you'll also lower your metabolic rate and lower your core temperature. Temperature will drop. Your body has a way of conserving calories so not to lose muscle mass. In doing so, by reducing my caloric burn, my body is slowing the rate at which it's aging because your metabolic rate is the rate at which you're aging. A higher metabolic rate, you're aging faster. When you're aging faster, your tissues are being utilized quicker, and your muscles and your bones are getting weaker faster with aging. Mild caloric restriction actually keeps your muscles stronger and your bones more dense as you age. It's the excess calories that weaken you. 
when you slow the aging process, you maintain your youthful strength and vitality into your later years more easily. When they look at monkeys and baboons who they've caloric restricted for the first 25 years of their life, they find that when they're 40 years old, they look like 20 years, they're 20 years old, and they measure their strength, and they measure their bone mass and their muscle density, they find that these, mo these monkeys have the strength and agility of the teenage monkey, because they calorically restricted them somewhat. Did you follow that? You want to be lean. And let me say this, you know, I know I say this all the time, but there's no such thing as an overweight person who's healthy. Fat on your body saps your health and shortens your lifespan. Fat cells also produce carcinogenic substances. Fat cells secrete excess estrogen, which increases the risk of prostate and breast cancer. Fat cells secrete angiogenesis promoters, which, which, is, which increase blood vessels fueling tumor growth and fueling the growth of fat cells. So they secrete angiogenesis promoters to help them grow fat, but the, in doing so, they also promote cancer. Fat cells are also the garbage depot of your body where most of the toxins and poisons are stored away. And you don't store as many toxins in your body when you don't have much fat on your body. When you, and fat cells can grow very, very rapidly when they're put on, but they take more time to get them off. So I can take a tablespoon of olive oil of 120 calories, and within five minutes that olive oil can be broken down, digested into the bloodstream, stored away in my butt or my waist or my hips as fat in the same form you took it in as. Five minutes from the lips to the hips. Now I can do an electron, um, we can do a biopsy and put it under an electron microscope and we could see where that fat came from. I could see, is that fat from pork? Or is that cow fat? Or is that, you know, dairy products? Or is that olive oil fat? We could look right under the microscope and see where the fat structure and see where you ate that fat that's stored in your body. body doesn't change, it just stores it right away. as the fat that it came in on. Very efficient at storing fat. But now, when you lose fat, when you lose, when you're using up your energy, your body's not burning that fat. It's burning mostly glycogen that's stored in your liver and muscle tissue. The fat just stays on you. It's only when glycogen stores get relatively low. When your sugar content of your muscle tissue and your, and your liver is low, the body starts to really fit more effectively burn your stored fat. Most Americans never burn store fat. They keep eating too frequently. They eat food, they store glycogen and fat, they burn off their glycogen, they, put more, they don't burn off their fat. They keep putting more fat on their body. Putting more cancer-causing, lifespan-shortening tissue on their body. They carry around those carcinogens all their life on their body. Stop carrying around carcinogenic substances like having being radiated every day. So you got that first principle, right? Now you guys got it. We want to slow the aging process by making sure you don't overeat. So how do we not overeat? What's that? You have to fill up on healthy food, yes. You have to need enough healthy food because when you, lower, when you increase the micronutrient density of your own body's tissues, and when you lower the retained waste in your tissues, then you're not going to feel shaky and weak, and you're not going to crave food when you're not eating. You're not going to require to eat to keep your energy up because your energy is going to be good whether you eat or not all day long. You're not going to require food when you don't need food. And then when you do need food, the food's going to taste better. Because a primary symptom of hunger is enhanced taste sensation. So you might come up to me and say, hey, Joel, I made you this great soup. I want you to try it. You're going to love it. I made it just for you. And I'm going to say, well, I prefer, thank you so much, but I prefer not to eat it right now because I'm not hungry. I just ate like an hour ago or an hour and a half ago. But if I can take the soup home with me and wait till I get hungry four hours from now, I'd probably enjoy it. I'm not going to enjoy eating a food if I'm not hungry. I'm not going to want to eat when I'm not hungry. I want to fully enjoy the meal when I am hungry. So I'm not going to want to eat it. I prefer to eat less calories so I can enjoy eating more. They always say, you know, appetite or hunger is the best sauce. And true hunger is a precise computer directing you to the exact amount of calories you're supposed to be consuming each day. What I'm saying right now, if you're eating outside of the demands of hunger, 
that's called recreational eating or emotional eating or addictive eating, that's why people get overweight. If you only ate when you were really hungry, you couldn't become overweight because hunger is directs you to the exact amount of calories you need to maintain your perfect weight to maximize your lifespan. So you got that? Should I say that again? If you're eating when you're truly hungry, you're maximizing your lifespan. If you're eating outside of hunger, you're shortening your lifespan. Every time you eat when you're not hungry, you're shortening your lifespan. If you want to extend your lifespan dramatically, only eat when you're hungry. Problem is, nobody in this room knows what hunger feels like. You always eat when you're not hungry. I'm going to explain that right now. The standard American diet, which I also call the DAD diet, or the DAD diet, the deadly American diet, is more than half of their calories come from processed foods, junk foods, and fast food. That's, the, that's what they're eating, people are eating. They're eating soda and cookies and crackers and rice cakes and pizza and breakfast cereals shot out of cannons and made by leprechauns. <laughs> really, the artificial coloring and sweeteners and sugars and I, it's like, I can't fathom how people will put this poisonous chemicals in their body. Can't understand it. How you could drink a soda? How could a person drink soda? It's a chemicalized concoction. Who would put it in their body? I remember I was talking today, I remembered when my, I have four kids, when my, my 23 year old daughter is named Kara, when she was four, she, she was in a, this um, health club at a, at a kid's boot camp and she called it boo-boo camp. And she came out of boo-boo camp and she said to me, don't these parents love their children? And I said, what are you talking about, Kara? Of course they love their children. What do you think they're bringing them here for? And she said, well, they're bringing them donuts and crackers and rice ca and, and um, chips and stuff, all kinds of junk food that's gonna hurt their body and damage them, damage their body. And I said, they don't know what we know. They don't know that, um, that what you eat makes your body. She looked at me and said, as a four-year-old, how could they be so stupid? How could they not know what you eat makes your body? <laughs> They're poisoning their kids. And I said, it's like if you woke up in the morning and you went to the school bus and every kid was smoking a cigarette and every parent was smoking a cigarette, waving goodbye, and they would just think it's normal because just people think poisoning themselves are normal because everybody else is doing it. And, nobody, you know, and so the people who look strange are people who are not smoking. And now the people that look strange are people that are not poisoning their children. They just, people just follow along with what society does without thinking like, like lemmings. They didn't say like lemmings to her, but they just follow along like over the cliff without even thinking what they're doing. And because they're food addicts themselves, they don't, they don't want to think that what they're doing is wrong for themselves. They just poison their kids and create cancer in their kids and ruin their kids' intelligence. Destroy their intelligence with junk foods and increase their risk of developing mental illness, schizophrenia, or depression by feeding them kids junk food and candy, increase their kids' propensity to have drug abuse and drug use and crime and violence because they're feeding them these foods that destroy the brain. And they have no idea. I didn't say that to my daughter. So my daughter, she, they understood it to a, she understood it to a degree, but the, my kids were always totally shocked, shocked at how parents would just poison their own kids. And they always took so much pride and got so much pleasure of all the healthy stuff we would eat that tasted so great. You know, and, and they couldn't understand why other people would do that stuff. And it's so, it's so straightforward. I couldn't understand it last night. I can't understand it how people just poison themselves with the, for a mere second of something that might taste good for a second and it's gone and you just to take years off your life or to create, or to create the possibly being demented or getting cancer was it worth it when you can make something that tastes just as good that's healthy for you. Can't understand it. And here's the American diet di designed by ISIS. with the processed foods and the animal products. Americans eat less than 5% of calories from, from produce. It says 11% can include you know, French fries and ketchup. It's all mixed in there, but of course, this is a, the worst diet you could possibly design. I'm gonna go into it a little further and show you really how bad it is. But fast food has these characteristics. It has synthetic ingredients, chemicals, usually carcinogens in it. White bread, that pizza, has potassium bromate in it. Potassium bromate in it. It's a class two carcinogen. Right in there. What could be more cancer causing than a pizza? You mix together the white flour, which is high glycemic, creating ins excess insulin exposure, with the cheese that promotes IGF-1, or the fake oil on top with the chemicals in it. So it's digested and absorbed rapidly, which is very important, because the dopamine release in the brain is dependent or caused by the spiking of calories entering the bloodstream. When you have some beans or some squash, the carbohydrates enter your bloodstream at one or two calories per minute. 
when you're having pizza or salad oil or ice cream or cake or croissants, the calories are entering your bloodstream at like 50 calories a minute. Did you follow that? When you had that oil, it entered the bloodstream of five minutes, 120 calories. That's like 20 calories a minute or 30 calories a minute. It's the concentrated calories that flood the bloodstream that sets off dopamine release in the brain the same as does snorting cocaine or shooting up with heroin. It goes into cocaine or the heroin into the bloodstream rapidly. When a doctor gives you a bolus of a medication, he uses a needle and he injects it with a syringe into the bloodstream. It's called a bolus. It enters the bloodstream all at once. If you put, it, he put the medication with an IV drip on a bag, he can drip it in at one drip every 30 seconds. That's the way you're supposed to be eating where food comes in slowly because then your body doesn't make hormones and doesn't, make you, doesn't develop food addictive sensations in the brain. The high level of calories entering the bloodstream gives you a sensational high as if you had snorted cocaine or taking an opiate and it hits the same dopamine receptors as taking the opiate or snorting the cocaine does. But the problem with the opiates and the, and the cocaine or the tobacco or the caffeine is when you stop taking in the co cocaine or the tobacco, you feel like crap. You feel good when you take it in, but when you stop doing it, your body attempts to recover from the damage. And recovery from the damage causes discomfort. You get shaky, you get itchy, you get anxiety, you get fatigue. See, feeling ill is getting well because when your body circulates poisons and toxins to try to remove them and it's the bloodstream, you feel bad. You can itch and you can feel tired when your body's trying to repair something. Here's what I'm saying right now. I'm saying that feeling really good from something is not good for you. When you eat broccoli, you don't make, it doesn't make you feel high, you feel nothing. <laughs> Anything that, makes, that gives you that spike of energy, ah, I feel great, or I took it and I feel so strong, it's not good for you. Look, I can give you an herbal remedy that can raise your blood pressure and lower your blood pressure, raise your pulse and lower your pulse, make you urinate more, make you urinate less, put you to sleep, wake you up, make your heartbeat slower, make your heartbeat faster. But the efficacy of the substance is related to its toxicity. The only reason it has the pharmacologic effects is because the natural herb has some toxins or poisons in it. Food that we eat, we try to get foods that don't have tox many toxins or poisons in them. They don't have medicinal effects to do anything to us. They don't take away our headaches. They don't give us energy. If it took away your headaches, it's poisonous. If it made you feel better, it's poisonous. We're trying to live in a manner to avoid the need for pharmacologic substances, whether natural or not. We want to avoid the need for, for medical care, and that includes alternative medical care. Did you follow that? You want to live in a manner to not need care. You're already healthy. You don't need to put any stuff into your body extra. But these foods have a lot of extra stuff in them, except for nutrients. They're nutritionally barren, and they're high in sugar and salt, right? They're, they're damaging, but they don't give you the good stuff. And the glycemic, their glycemic load is high.